Why do Reformed Christians, along with every other traditional branch of Christianity, baptize our babies? Well, there are many reasons, but the biggest one is that it is the most pure portrayal of the Gospel. Hey guys, welcome back to Kingdom Craft, where I build this big church in Minecraft while I talk about Christian theology. So today I'm going to be talking about infant baptism. It's something that Presbyterians and other uh, historic Reformed Christians practice, but we are not unique in practicing that. Really, the people who are unique are the ones who do not baptize their babies, because that only got really popular um, in the ever since the Reformation with certain branches of the Radical Reformation, like the Baptists and non-denominationals who are really just Baptists with a smoke machine. So, yeah, but why does why do all of us baptize our babies? So, um, I'm gonna go into, like, our view of the Covenant and how circumcision relates to baptism, and that, you know, baptism bestows benefits on the child that are very important. But the first thing, and this is something my pastor talked about in a sermon, um, right after we baptized a baby in my church. Um, now my church is a PCUSA church, but it's one of, one of the good ones, so to speak. The way mainline Protestant denominations work is, like, most of it is just, you know, bad, secular, um, liberal theology, but you still will find a minority of churches that are rooted in historic Christianity. So my church is one of those. My church still, I can't pretend my church doesn't struggle with liberalism, because we do, but our pastor is very solidly reformed in his thinking, and so are some of our elders. So what he said was that, um, and I think this is very true, infant baptism is the purest distillation of the gospel. Because um, in the act of infant baptism, in contrast to believer's baptism, the um, person being baptized is completely passive. They are not doing anything. They're not even aware of what's happening to them. And that is really how salvation works. Salvation, especially if you're in the Reformed tradition, but I think it's pretty historic Augustinian classical Christianity to say, Salvation is passive on our part, and it's active on God's part. So we don't believe baptism is something we do. We believe baptism is a work of God. Now there's a difference between like outward baptism, which is like the ceremony, the water, and inward baptism, which is um, being converted by the Holy Spirit. And in Reformed thinking, those two things happen, or at least can happen at different times, but they're still connected. So it's still right to attribute the work of one to the other, so it's still right to say baptism saves, even though we don't think the way the Lutherans and Catholics do, that everyone who was baptized is regenerated and regenerated at that moment. But um, whether baptism saves is a conversation for another time. Today I'm just going to be talking about why baptism should be administered to infants. So, yeah, like, even even for those who aren't comfortable saying baptism saves, they'll still say baptism signifies the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. That's another reason that we, our mode of baptism is pouring rather than full immersion, because um, baptism signifies the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, or rather, the pouring of water signifies the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, which are connected in the sacrament of baptism. Um, but, yeah, so the reason we give it to babies is um, because it shows that we are passive in, of course not the only reason we do it, but one of the reasons is because we do not believe that, y that we are the ones who make the first move, so to speak, in our salvation. Um, like, when I was, uh, I actually did get baptized as a believer, because um, it's a long story, actually, I I'll tell you anyway, because I thought I was baptized as a baby, so I went for like five years while believing in Christianity without actually getting baptized, because I thought I had been baptized when I was a baby, but turns out the group I was baptized into was a heretical cult that my parents um, stopped being involved with very soon after. So I was left, but I didn't, I didn't really know how heretical it was until, um, until like five years after, um, becoming Christian. And then once I found out, then I, I got, um, baptized for real. And, uh, I invited a lot of my friends to my baptism, many of whom were Baptists. And by the way, these are some of the most loving, um, compassionate and, uh, passionate, compassionate and passionate for Christ 
people I've ever met, so I'm not dissing them, but I am dissing their views on baptism. Um, so uh, they were like, well, if, if you get baptized as a baby, then it can't be like a personal choice. And I'm like, yeah, that's the point. That's what the gospel is. The gospel is not a personal choice. We are not active. God is the active party in um, our in our salvation. And all we are doing is experiencing it. We cannot contribute anything to our salvation. So, uh, yeah, that is um, why I think baptism is a pure distillation of the gospel. Jesus also said, let the little children come to me. Uh, God seems to have somewhat of a preferential treatment for for children. Jesus said, like, it, the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. Now, it's not saying only children can enter the kingdom of heaven. What it means is that, you know, th think about it. Uh, children are not, like, sort of skeptical and doubting the way adults are. Children just trust their parents and trust God, like, um, without really scrutinizing it. And, um... I'm not sure if all Reformed people would agree with this, but um, this is a more this is uh, something Lutherans would affirm. But I think you can affirm it if you're Reformed, and I, I tend to lean this way. Infants can have a primitive sort of faith that counts as faith. Infants can be regenerated at baptism. Like, uh, I definitely was not a believer until a certain point in my life, and I know I did have, like, a so-called born-again experience, but I know not everyone has that. Um, a lot of people who are raised uh, Christian, like my girlfriend, say they've always been Christian and they have, don't remember a time when they weren't. Now, back when I was a bit more Baptist influenced and more into born again, like born again thinking, I was like, oh, you probably just don't know the moment. You don't remember the moment you're born again. But now it's like, well, maybe people like her were just have really have always been Christian ever since the moment they were baptized. I believe that. Um, uh, regeneration does not always occur at the moment of baptism, but sometimes it does, and maybe it does more often than we think. I don't know. Um, there seems to be, in, in Scripture, there seems to be a strong connection between baptism and regeneration, and this idea is also reflected even in the early Calvinists. It's like later Calvinists who are influenced by Baptists and other um, low-church Protestants that stopped um, saying that baptism actually does something. But, no, it's, it's not just a symbol. It actually, I think, can uh, create faith in, uh, in a baby. Sometimes, though. Like, that's the big difference between uh, Reformed and Lutheran thinking. thinking. It's like, we, we believe a lot of similar things. But Reformed people stress the freedom of God to operate sovereignly however he wants. Like, Lutherans will say, in the sacrament, God always does this. And Reformed people say God works through this sacrament when he wants to. He doesn't always do this. So, um, Lutherans say baptism always saves, and um, Reformed people say baptism saves for the elect. And Lutherans will be like, hey, well, then there's nothing objective. It's like, what, do you expect baptism save to save the non-elect? Um, uh, but like I always say, I do have the utmost respect for Lutherans. And Lutherans and um, Calvinists are basically in agreement on infant baptism, even though we would work it out slightly differently, we both agree that you should baptize your babies, um, and because we think that's what the Bible tells us to do. So, where does the Bible actually say to do that? So there are a few things that, taken in conjunction, seem to make a pretty clear biblical case for infant baptism. So first of all, in the book of Acts, um, there are many uh, examples of household baptisms, where one uh, member of the household, usually the head of the household, would convert and then baptize their whole family. It's like, Wait, if shouldn't we wait until each member of their family makes an individual choice to be baptized? Um, but that's a very sort of American, Western, individualist way of thinking. But um, the Bible is not as is not as individualistic as we Americans are. Um, I think that's why Baptists are like so popular in America and basically nowhere else, because um, Bap that the Baptist branch of Christianity is the most individualistic branch because they think you know, being baptized should always be a personal choice, an individual choice, whereas um, other, uh, like, more traditional branches of Christianity say, oh, baptism is not like an individual expression of faith. It, um, it's uh, belonging to the Christian family, the Christian covenant. So yeah, um, entire households were baptized in the book of Acts, which seems to reflect the more communal um, interpretation of baptism uh, than the more individualistic interpretation of it. 
so also, uh, baptism is a sign of the new covenant, and circumcision was a sign of the old covenant given to Abraham, and uh, babies were circumcised. Now, sir, it did it does say circumcision is a sign to be received by faith, and yet babies were still circumcised because they were part of the covenant. Likewise, um, for us, even though, even if babies can't make an outward expression of faith yet, if um, someone is born to believing parents, they really are part of the covenant. And they're made, you know, they're sealed as part of the covenant through baptism. That's why we say baptism is a sign and a seal of the covenant. Now, I, I don't like when people say it's a sign and seal and then just stop there because it actually does more. Baptism is actually connected to what it signifies. Um, that's not like federal vision stuff. That's just historic reformed orthodoxy. But um, it's uh, a lot of modern Presbyterians who uh, sort of downplay uh, the efficacy of baptism. Baptismal efficacy is a historic reform, I think the historic reform teaching on baptism. Um, but yeah, so baptism does make us part of the covenant just the way circumcision did. And in Colossians 2, there's a passage that really seems to tie circumcision and baptism together. Um, saying it it really it really seems to say that they have a, a similar function so uh there's also in acts where peter says repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins so he's saying you know baptism has something to do with the forgiveness forgiveness of sins because it unites us to christ in whom our sins are forgiven so he says repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins and the promise is for you and your children so that seems to make a pretty good case for, you know, baptism actually doing something, not just being a symbol. And also, you know, the promise given in baptism should be given to our children as well. She seems to explicitly say that, the pro like, baptism is a covenant promise. And Peter says, the promise is for you and your children. Um, so, like, he, um, like individually all these things from the bible that i've just mentioned could be interpreted away but when you take them together it does seem to make a very strong case for infant baptism now of course there's not a slam dunk proof text because if there was then this wouldn't even be a debate like there are things there are slam dunk proof texts for and that's why there's not really debate about them there's not a debate among you know bible believing christians over whether jesus rose from the dead because it explicitly says that but it's these things that are a bit less clear, which we will have to debate, but we still should debate. And I think, I'm not someone who wants to avoid theological debates. I think as long as we're still respectful to each other as brothers and sisters, debates are good to have. Because um, it causes us to think more about these issues. So yeah, that is uh, the Presbyterian case for why we baptize our babies. And uh, before, before I go, I just want to say something funny that I heard. Um, so... Uh, another thing that Presbyterians and Baptists often disagree on is the mode of baptism. Presbyterians usually practice baptism by sprinkling or pouring, and Baptists almost universally do full immersion. They really dunk someone entirely into the water. And there's more of a historic case for full immersion because the Eastern Orthodox also practice that. So, um, the Eastern Orthodox are the only ones who practice both infant baptism and baptism by immersion, so that's why you have all those funny videos of, like, Orthodox priests dunking babies in a little bowl of water. But, um, so, there's, a, I heard this one Presbyterian pastor in this church, like, I don't know, London City Presbyterian or whatever. I'll leave a link to it in, in the bio because it's a really great Presbyterian sermon on baptism. But he said, like, there's a passage from First Peter 3. It says, um, uses the example of Noah in the flood. It said, Noah and his family were saved through water, and this water symbolizes baptism, which now saves you. So this pastor uh, said, quoting that um, verse from First Peter, he said, uh, like, you know, in the, in the story of the flood, um, Noah and his family, the ones who were saved, they were sprinkled with water. Everyone else was fully immersed. Similarly, um, the Exodus, like uh, the parting of the Red Sea, being saved through the waters there, that's also often used as a um, sort of prefigure of baptism. In that case as well, the Israelites were sprinkled with water and the Egyptians were fully immersed. So in, in all these cases, full immersion is generally not for the people that God likes. Sprinkling is for the people that God likes. Okay, that's just a joke. Of course God loves Baptists. And God even loves Presbyterians, even though I don't really understand how that's possible. So, um... 
yeah, thanks for watching. This is just my case. I don't express it as eloquently as some others could, but I did my best. So uh, thanks for watching, and I'll see you later.